Welcome back, guys. It feels so good to be back in town. For the last two weeks, I've been in Colorado with a group of friends on our annual off-road and camping trip. I had a blast. I broke a bunch of stuff on my truck. I filmed the entire thing. I've got an episode coming out in a week or two if you're interested in that. But today, we're going to dive back into the 308 and see if we can make some progress. When you take two weeks off of a project like this, you build a lot of resting inertia, and it can be really hard to overcome that and pick up the tools again. But we're gonna dive in with something fun. I figure why not try getting some of our aero components mounted, starting with the splitter. We've gotta engineer a solution that's easy to install and remove, while also being strong enough to support the weight of the splitter and all of the downforce that it's gonna generate. So let's get creative and build something. The last time we worked on the 308 was almost three whole weeks ago. And at the time, we put the car on the lift for the first time, where we chipped away at progress on plumbing the brake system. We've still got a little ways to go, but today I'd rather focus on something that's a bit more enticing. I want to get the arrow mounted underneath the car, or at least get started on it. So we're going to get the car up in the air once again and take a look at what we have to work with. Under the nose of the car are two very strong frame rails, and it's from these that we'll likely aim to support most of our load. It's been a while since we've seen it, but what we need to support is our RS Future Splitter, which I last mocked up under the car in our Wing Reveal episode. This is a one-off splitter that RS Future developed specifically for our 308 project. Some months ago, he came out to the shop, took a bunch of measurements, made a few templates, and returned with this 11-pound carbon fiber splitter. But while Amir did the hard work of building the thing, it's still on us to actually mount it to the car. So let's get it mocked up and figure out how we want to do that. As you guys can see, there's currently no provisions to attach anything to the splitter itself. So we're going to have to develop some mounts that we can attach to it. We're also going to need to find several points on the chassis that we can attach to. The splitter is going to develop a lot of downforce and therefore need a lot of support. I spent a lot of cumulative hours trying to decide exactly how I want to attach the splitter to the car itself. Obviously, we could do something really simple like running some bolts up through the splitter and into some extensions that then attach to the chassis. Something very simple, straightforward, and solid. But instead of that, I decided to put forth some design constraints to yield a better finished product. I made a traced paper template with the splitter in place on the car, and then on the workbench, drew up some ideas that I think could become a finished mount. But before I show you the CAD file, let's talk about what those design constraints are. The first and most important is that I want the removal of the splitter to require no tools. I don't want any sockets or wrenches needed in order to remove this thing in case I need to do it on the side of the road to get this thing onto a tow truck or a trailer. I want serviceability to be absolutely paramount, so it needs to come off as simply as possible. The second is that I want to be able to remove the splitter without the use of a jack. I don't want to get underneath the car, I'd rather pop the hood and be able to remove it that way. I don't want to have to remove the front bumper or air dam or any other part of the car to remove the splitter, and I don't want any hardware going up through the bottom, because the heads of those bolts will get ground down through driving the car, making removal of that hardware all but impossible. Last but not least, we do need some adjustable brackets so that we can extend this splitter for track use. This is definitely a tough list of demands, but it's one that I think that we can accomplish, and I spent some time trying to figure it out, so let me show you what I've drawn up. Now I spent a lot of time in Fusion 360 figuring this one out. We've got the chassis of the 308 represented by the yellow blocks. Extending down from them is a pair of brackets that we will weld to the chassis. Each of those brackets has two pegs sticking out of it, represented by the gold bolts. If we zoom in, you can see the main component of how this whole system is going to work. We have a pair of self-aligning hooks that will lift and then align the splitter into its final resting place. A number of holes at the bottom of this hook structure allows us to re-index the splitter fore and aft on the car. But most importantly, a pair of pit pins actually locks everything into place, and it's with these that we can remove the splitter using no tools at all. Now if you don't know what a pit pin is, I've got some here, and these are a really cool track-oriented part. Let's take a closer look and I'll show you how they work. These in particular have an 8mm shaft, and there's a button on the end. Pressing the button releases the locks, and if we use an 8mm washer, you can see how it functions. If we press the button, we can slide the washer over the shaft, but if we don't, it's locked into place. 
We can use this principle to lock the splitter to the car. And these pit pins also have a lanyard that we can rivet to the chassis so we don't have to worry about losing them when we take the splitter off. Now let's talk about having no hardware under the splitter. I've decided to use some weld nuts attached to some massively oversized washers to distribute the load. And we're gonna pass these through the core of the splitter and then bolt to them from the top. The upshot here is that even if we do grind these away on rough roads or on track, we can still get them out. We're not relying on the head of a bolt to be usable after sustaining damage. In fact, because they have an open end, we could put a bolt and a nut in the end of it, tighten the nut, and then back them out with a bolt from the bottom side, making this relatively foolproof. I'm sure someone a lot smarter than me could come up with a better system overall, but I'm really happy with how I've decided to mount this splitter, so now we just need to get these parts cut. So with our mounts designed and sent off to Send Cut Send, we have another design project to conquer, and that's figuring out what to do with this gap that exists between the front air dam or valence and the splitter itself. It changes in shape going all the way across the front, and we need to close that up, and I'd like to do something that looks good, obviously. Now, ideally, I'd love to try scanning this gap with our phone. I showed you guys in a previous episode kind of the basics of that, and I'd like to try it out and see if we can model a piece that can go in this gap, and then from there, 3D print it, probably in multiple pieces, so that we can install it, make a carbon overlay, and have a carbon part that fills this gap and makes the whole thing function properly. But if I wanna do that, I'm gonna need a 3D printer. I've been talking about adding a 3D printer to the shop for quite some time. Obviously, I've got the CAD skill set, and I'd love to be able to turn out quick and prototype parts, test pieces, and simple parts that we can actually use. And this Ender 3 Pro went on sale, so I decided to jump on it. I feel like I'm really late to the 3D printer game, but better late than never, and how hard could this stuff really be? I got the whole kit put together, and everything's looking really promising. All that's left is to go through the setup process, and then get some prints going. Alright, so I've got the printer assembled, as you guys can see. It powers on, all that jazz. However, I'm about ready to throw this thing in the dumpster, because I'm hitting issue after issue. The firmware, the menu, it's missing options I'm supposed to have. I can't even follow the instructions that came with this thing until I update it. In order to update it, I've got to have like a bootloader and an Arduino and a whole bunch of other stuff I don't know anything about. I've had to download a whole like Marlin software coding base and a, a code compiler, VS Code software. I mean, just all of this stuff in order to try to make this thing work. And I'm really quickly realizing I'm not happy with it. This is not the experience that I wanted. I know that it's possible to make this thing go, but the more people that I talk to after posting on Instagram about it, the more I'm realizing that this is definitely like kind of a DIY, mod it, build it, code it yourself type of thing, and that's not what I'm here to do. I just want to 3D print some parts. So we're gonna scrap this idea, I'm gonna send it back. I'm gonna follow my buddy Alex Nelson's suggestion. I'm gonna get a Prusa machine that will work straight out of the box that I don't have to tinker with because I'm really eager to 3D print some stuff and put my CAD software skill set to work, but not like this. This is not fun so far. So let's pretend like this segment didn't happen and let's work on the car again. Hold on, I'm not quite done talking about tools. Some of you guys might remember when I bought this Ryobi belt sander and ever since I've been putting it through its paces. More than a year of abuse on this $150 machine and I have to say it's done a great job. I did not expect it to last this long and I'd suggest it to anybody looking for a small hobby machine. However, this recently fell into my lap. It is a Dayton 20 inch disc sander a two horsepower, 220 volt, 1750 RPM monster. Now I was given this machine by a friend because it doesn't work. It arrived at his shop in a non-working state and after a warranty claim, a new one was delivered and this one was never taken back. And after sitting around for a long time, he finally told me to take it off his hands. Now there's something wrong with the motor, so I took the whole thing apart and dropped the motor off across the street at an electric motor repair shop, and it turns out it was just wired up wrong. Maybe it was made on a Friday at 4.59pm or Monday morning at 7.01. But after a $45 repair bill, I got the motor back, I put the machine back together, and it turns out this thing is unreal. 
It chewed this 3 16ths inch piece of steel up like it was nothing. A hot knife through butter, if you will. I am thrilled to get to put this thing through its paces and see what it's going to offer in the way of fabrication. This thing is an amazing addition to the shop, and you cannot beat a $45 purchase price. Now I just need to patiently wait for the next big fab project. All right, enough about tools. I've got some new parts to show you. We've got some side splitters. These are our side splitters from RS Future, and they'll be traveling down the rocker panels and between the fender flares of our bodywork. If you want to see what they look like on a car, here is a mirror of RS Futures NSX, and you can see them here at the bottom of the doors. As for how they work, that's a question he's better equipped to answer and we'll touch upon in a future episode featuring his car. These side splitters are going to require a lot of cutting and trimming in order to fit, and I got started on that process, but unfortunately the lift arms are going to keep us from making any real progress. But I'm working on some mounts, and we're going to touch upon these parts again in an episode very soon. But in the interim, let's go back to the brakes that we worked on in the last episode. While I was out of town, these arrived, and if you don't know what they are, they're one of the coolest pieces of the entire brake system. They're called dry brake fittings, and what they allow us to do is to effortlessly and simply remove the brake calipers from the car for servicing or any other purpose without having to bleed the brakes. These fittings separate without allowing any air into the system, and it means serviceability just got a whole lot easier. But let's look closely at these fittings and talk quickly about these 37 degree AN fittings on the ends. Pretty much every single brake component on this car, from the master cylinders to these dry brake fittings, use 37 degree AN fittings, or JIC fittings, if you will. In my brake line episode a few weeks ago, a bunch of you commented and said you should never use single flare fittings like this one on brakes. And I want to chime in on that. Now, I should say I'm not an expert. Do your own research. But if you look at any motorsports application, they all use this type of fitting for their brakes. Using this is fine. The problem is flaring your own single flare brake fittings. And we talked about that in the last episode. If you're not careful, you'll crack the material. And if you crack the material, you'll have a leak. If you leak, you lose your brakes. If you lose your brakes, you could kill somebody. And we don't want that. And I spent a lot of time in the last episode making sure I got all of my flares really nice and correct. And I've done this many times. I've put these fittings on a lot of cars, never had a single issue. However, I do feel like these days with this platform, it's my obligation to lead by example and follow everything with respect to safety as closely as I can. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scrap what progress we made on the brake system a few weeks ago, and I'm going to soft line the entire car. I'm going to take measurements of what we got, and I'm going to have a hose shop make stainless braided lines for the rest of the system so that we can just hook it up and be done with it. This is a very common way to do the brakes on race cars. Plenty of cars are done this way. It's totally fine, totally safe. And by using machined 37 degree fittings, we're not gonna have any leak issues. And I think it's the right way to do this. I think it's the best way to lead by example, as opposed to leaving anything to chance, no matter how good I think I got it. Hey, let's just, uh, let's just do the smart thing here. It will cost me a little bit of money, definitely cost me some time, but I think it's the way to go. And as some of you guys pointed out, using stainless line can be prone to cracking and this car is going to vibrate a bunch. So let's just do it that way. Sometimes you take two steps forward and then two steps back, but at least we know what direction to go. On that note, that's everything I have in this episode. And if you liked it, please leave a like. If you aren't subscribed, you should be. We're getting closer and closer on this car and your support means a bunch to guys like me. Every small creator benefits when you support them. So subscribe to my channel, subscribe to other channels, show people that you like the effort they're putting in. But I'm not quite done with the episode yet. I've got some final episode thoughts that I wanted to chime in and put into this episode because they felt valuable. And I really like showing everything that goes into a build like this, including some of the non-glamorous or sometimes just kind of frustrating stuff. As I said in the beginning of the episode, I spent two weeks on vacation, or at least some form of vacation at least. Coming back and getting back to work on this car was a huge challenge. I mean, obviously I want this car done, I'm excited to work on it, but I had no idea where to begin. It just felt like starting over from square one, I had no motivation and tons of inertia to overcome. 
when you stop and you lose all that momentum on a build, it can be really, really difficult to get started again. I sat here and just stewed on it for a couple of days. It was a huge struggle. I actually felt nothing but frustration over it. And I'm only sharing this not to complain. I'm still excited. We're back into it. We've got our momentum going again. But because I, I know that that feeling is relatable to a lot of other people out there with project cars. And you're not alone when you feel that way. It doesn't matter who it is. Everyone gets to that point on a project sooner or later. And all I can say is the only way to overcome it is to pick up the tools and force yourself to work. And man, is it tough to do sometimes. It's so difficult. But you have to pick up the tools. You have to dive into it. It could take a few minutes, could take a few hours or days even, but eventually it'll click, you'll have your motivation back, and it'll be game on, you'll be making progress just like we are here. So get out in the garage, turn a wrench, get something done, get that project car off your jack stands, let's get these things done. I'll catch you guys next week. Thank you as always for the support.